Okay, thank you uh, for the invitation to attend here. It's always a, a pleasure to uh, present some of our biomechanical research. And uh, the reason I'd like to present this topic today is um, I've always taken pleasure in studying the natural biomechanics of the joint, and I think that it provides a really strong motivation to do whatever possible to preserve the natural hip joint. And so what I'm going to talk today about is a bit uh, lubrication mechanisms within the joint. So it's a continuation of what I presented um, last time I was here with also some newer results. Now the hip joint um, is quite a phenomenal mechanical joint. I don't think we're able to produce a synthetic joint that can match the lubrication performance of the, the natural hip. Uh, it has so many fail-safe mechanisms built in and so many modes of lubrication that it really is for me a wonder as a mechanical engineer. So starting with what we call a squeeze film lubrication mode. Um, on the left, you see this is a rather obscure paper, but it's always been fascinating for me. It was a cryosection through joints under load. And you can see a fairly thick fluid film between the femoral head and the acetabulum, which seems to be retained by the, the labrum. And that was what actually kicked off my PhD research into the labrum function. Maybe you've read a little bit about the sealing uh, function of the labrum. I'm not going to talk about that here. But it seems that this squeeze film, this thick fluid film, is the first line of defense in the joint. And it can retain fluid for maybe 10, 20, 30 seconds under ideal conditions. Um, I looked also a little bit in the past what happens if that initial seal of the labrum goes away and then you have contact of the cartilage layers. Is that game over for uh, a low friction articulation in the joint? Well, no, it seems that uh, some natural characteristics of the cartilage tissue itself also contribute to a long-lasting low friction articulation. So on the left, I've just sort of graphically shown uh, what happens in the different phases of contact in the hip joint. So on the left, you see uh, a thick fluid film held in by the labrum. Eventually, this seal is, is compromised. The cartilage surfaces come together. But even then, the resistance for water, interstitial fluid, to be pressed out of the cartilage is so high, it takes literally minutes to hours to wring out the water content of the cartilage. And there's a variety of papers in the last five years or so that have shown that this sponge-like behavior of the cartilage this ability for the cartilage to carry load mostly by pressurized water leads to an incredibly low friction coefficient. So the cartilage is naturally a self-limiting, um, has a self-limiting mechanism for retaining water inside the tissue and for uh, limiting, therefore, friction. On the right is a sketch out of a paper from a fellow named McCutcheon who studied, right back in the 50s even, this whole idea of what he called the weeping lubrication. So, Besides the squeeze film that I showed before, McCutcheon said that cartilage um, naturally um, expresses water under load. It's a bit counterintuitive that as you press the cartilage, it squeezes water out into the space between the two contacting surfaces and is self-lubricating. It's almost like having a little oil pump inside your joint that's pressing a lubricating fluid between these surfaces. But never really described if that's feasible. It was a speculation, a proposal, and then the topic just died for about two decades. So what can engineers do on the mechanical side? We have all these beautiful arthroplasty prosthesis designs. Surely they must be better than the natural joint, right? We have clever engineers like me making prostheses. Well, this is a simulation uh, from some colleagues, collaborators in Imperial College of the lubricating film that can be developed inside a prosthesis joint under load. So they have a, a computer simulation of a, an ordinary compliant elastic prosthesis on the left. Bottom left is actually showing some pressure contours inside the joint under load. The top right is the pressure curve in the fluid within this prosthesis joint during a gait cycle. So some of you probably recognize this double hump characteristic. This is corresponding to the natural loading of the joint. Uh, first hump is heel strike, second hump is toe off. And you'll see that you have pressures of up to 50 megapascal, which is 500 times atmospheric pressure. It's high. On the bottom left is the fluid film thickness that they calculate in these simulations, and it's on the order of 40 to 60 nanometers. So I don't know if you can see a nanometer, but I can't. This is very small. The natural joint has pressures uh, 10 times lower, or even 20 times lower in green, top left, and the fluid film thickness in the natural joint is 100 times thicker than what you find in the prosthetic joint. So there must be something great about the natural joint to keep this working. So we thought maybe it has to do with how fluid is, is transported out of this gap between the two cartilage surfaces. Is there something that's limiting the rate of fluid expression out of the gap? There was some work uh, about 30 years ago, experimental work, which tried to measure this interarticular gap flow. 
Um, they managed to show some rather heterogeneous pressure distributions in the hip joint and some very first basic calculations of fluid velocities inside the joint, but it was rather um, uh, inconclusive. None of the models or experiments really studied this possibility of uh, fluid flowing in this interarticular gap and quantified it. Um, recently, also in the past decade, there have been the first really good measurements of cartilage surface roughness. Most of you would consider cartilage very smooth if you look at it with your fingers and, and your eyes, but actually it has a roughness on the order of about one micron, so small undulations. This is going to be important for, uh, I think, uh, hip joint function. The second thing that's quite unique compared to a, a mechanical joint is the fluid that's actually lubricating it. So the synovial fluid is very unique in that the thickness or the, the viscosity of the fluid changes with the speed of, of motion. The faster you move your joint, the thinner the fluid becomes. Uh, that's shown on the, the, the left, oh, sorry, on the right. And also the, this viscosity or thickness of the fluid changes with the disease state of the joint. So as you go from a healthy joint to a degenerated to an inflamed joint, the thickness or the viscosity of the fluid decreases, which may also influence lubrication in the joint. So we looked a little bit at how fluid actually flows in this interarticular gap. So we took the scale of our observation from the joint scale down to this sort of micron to millimeter scale and tried to see if this roughness of the cartilage surface and the synovial fluid viscosity play a role in keeping a lubricating fluid film in the joint. So you see a, a rather abstract version of this interarticular gap showing the surface roughness. And we want to see what influence this microtopography and synovial fluid has on keeping fluid inside the joint. So we looked at the overall roughness of the cartilage surfaces, how these peaks and valleys are distributed, and a few other characteristic um, arc, um, geometric features. Main thing we found is that the roughness has a very uh, strong influence on the, the rate that fluid is pressed out of this intraarticular space. So we looked at how much pressure was required to squeeze fluid out of this intraarticular gap and found that it was 10% higher for rough versus smooth surfaces. Some other factors played a role, such as how dense these hills and valleys are in the cartilage surface, but overall it seems that surface roughness is the um, the key factor governing uh, how quickly fluid can be expressed out. So here I've summarized that this overall micro roughness of the cartilage surface increases the retention of fluid film by up to 10% uh, in comparison to a perfectly smooth surface. It's not, not a lot, but it's already a contribution. So having a not perfectly smooth surface seems to be advantageous. Then we looked a little bit further and said, well, what happens when these surfaces actually start to come together? Because I had a hypothesis way back in my PhD that this must be somehow a self-limiting system. There must be something happening. Most systems in nature are nonlinear. That means that their response changes with time, um, quite often in a protective way. So when all your safety nets have been thrown out, uh, there's always something that you can still grab onto in, in nature. So we extended the simulations a bit to see what happens when these rough surfaces come together and you gradually squeeze out that fluid film. So on the left you see the, um, a representation of this fluid space between the joint. And on the right is showing after the first peaks have started to come together. So the, the white areas in that graph are where two cartilage mountains have touched each other. And all the gray is still the fluid that can flow around it. Now, I'm not going to bore you with lots of velocity plots, but what we found basically was in the situation on the left, before there's contact, you have quite an even flow of the fluid through this gap. And as these individual mountains come together, the flow path becomes very tortuous. So for fluid to get out of the joint space, it has to really turn left, right, left, right. And that means that the fluid velocity slows down dramatically as the joint surfaces start to come together. So this is the... Um, the, the velocity out of, the, in, out of this intraarticular space in comparison to perfectly smooth surfaces, once they come into contact, there's a dramatic increase in the resistance to fluid uh, being pressed out. So it's a self-limiting um, function. It seems to be that there's a surface sealing process going on in the, uh, in the joint. So what we found from all these simulations, it seems that natural cartilage is a really highly developed bearing surface. This micro roughness um, helps to capture and, and retain fluid inside the interarticular space. That no doubt enhances lubrication. We're going to measure now the friction between cartilage surfaces against different roughnesses to see if that means, if it means anything. Uh, 
And this can enhance the retention of fluid by up to uh, two times in the joint. So a little bit of roughness isn't bad. A fibrillation, of course, grossly uh, damaged cartilage surfaces would not be good, but this natural slight roughness on the cartilage surface seems to be beneficial. Um, it's also been shown in engineered structures, so shark skin on boats and various other things. These can actually uh, decrease the friction between two surfaces. Can we apply that in clinical practice? Well, companies have tried to make rough surfaces on implants, um, golf ball-like or, or fluid pocket retaining prostheses. That's a good idea. Um, it does actually decrease the friction because it provides a reservoir for lubricating fluid. But it seems perhaps that this is still at the wrong scale. So this is at the millimeter scale, and we're talking about roughness at the micro scale. So that's topography. Um, I'd like to just say a little bit also about the synovial fluid, because this is what we've studied in the last uh, year or so, uh, and found something very interesting. So I'm going to propose to you that synovial fluid itself, as it's being dragged around inside the joint, is a mechanoregulator of cartilage health. So on the left, you see, again, the, um, this is basically the shearing stresses that are being applied to the cartilage as the joint is articulating or as the, as the fluid is moving across it. Uh, shearing stress is just like a frictional force on the surface of the, the, the joint. And it's been shown over the last decade or so that shear stresses influence chondrocyte metabolism quite strongly. And I've, we've calculated the shear stress uh, and its dependence on the synovial fluid viscosity. So in black is uh, healthy synovial fluid, in red is uh, inflammatory, so it's synovial, synovial fluid from an inflamed joint, and in blue from a heavily degenerated joint. And you'll see that the, the actual stress that's being applied to the individual, perhaps chondrocytes on the cartilage surface, is potentially increasing. And it's shown also graphically on the right, this is the overall uh, stress profile on the surface of the cartilage due to this fluid flow for ordinary synovial fluid on the left, it's very homogeneous, and for degenerated synovial fluid on the right, which is very heterogeneous with very high stress peaks. And we thought this might have an influence on cartilage metabolism, so we did some experiments where we actually uh, sheared fluid across cartilage constructs um, with and without different amounts of hyaluronic acid to change the viscosity to see if this would have uh, any influence on cartilage metabolism. So it's a mechanism uh, where we collaborate with the AO group in Davos. They have a system to take cartilage and to rub a ball over top of it with a predefined uh, velocity. We did a lot of groups, which I'm not going to talk about in detail, but basically um, we had static controls, controls where we pressed on the cartilage, and controls where we, uh, and groups where we actually articulated the fluid over the surface, and we added synovial fluid to increase the viscosity. And the one key finding that I want to show you, this is a very busy slide, but it's basically the gene expression from the, the chondrocytes of the cartilage for a variety of important uh, anabolic and catabolic genes. Um, and the first thing I'd like to highlight, in blue, these are the groups where we've applied a shearing, so a fluid flow. Uh, you see that this decreases the rate of collagen 1 production and increases the rate of collagen 2, which is leading to a much more healthy type of cartilage. So cartilage likes to have, it should have lots of collagen 2 and very little collagen 1. And this is enhanced by this fluid motion and further enhanced by the presence of lots of hyal hyaluronic acid. The second important thing we found is the gene HAS3, which is a modulator of hyaluronic acid synthesis. Um, this is dramatically increased by fluid flow and uh, the presence of, of high viscosity uh, synovial fluid. So it seems this is also beneficial for self-regulating the production of more hyaluronic acid. So the joint biologically makes more lubrication. We also saw that with, um, on the bottom, with the presence of fluid flow and hyaluronic acid, that collagen production progresses much deeper into the joint. So in summary, taking these two studies together, we think there's a really important interplay between the surface roughness of cartilage and lubrication. Um, these joints, surfaces are basically self-sealing and self-lubricating. And the synovial properties, because they change with disease, this can have a very important influence on cartilage metabolism. So this opens the question, is viscosupplementation perhaps not so bad? It might still be useful in the joint uh, to try to prevent some of these detrimental changes in the joint. And nevertheless, I think all of this taken together provides motivation for preserving the natural joint. Thank you.